That's <laughs> anyway, it's, it is truly good to have you here, and we've been on a series to do with missions, and I hope that it's opening a little door in your heart afresh for something that a lot of churches have forgotten to talk about, and I think there's so much in it, and tonight, I believe you'll be surprised what I talk about, and I hope I don't lose any of you in the process because uh, what we're going to talk about tonight is part four of missions in the modern church and you know whenever God gives a mission to a Christian there is always provision and you know the church has come unstuck on this whole thing about provision and we have ministers saying, you know, we shouldn't talk about provision. We shouldn't talk about wealth. We shouldn't talk about money. We shouldn't talk about prosperity. And they talk about the prosperity gospel. There's actually no such thing as the prosperity gospel. There's just provision for the mission. And, you know, we're, we're not meant to lack. That is not part of a Christian's life. Now, we go through times when things can get looking like there's a lack. And we read about Abraham and just about every character in the Bible had those times. But that is not where we park. We don't park there. We believe God for provision. We go through fire and water, the Bible says, but he brings us out into a wealthy place. That's the Hebrew. So... So I, I believe that talking about finance and prosperity in the context of missions actually balances it properly. Because in Abraham's covenant, there was a top line and a bottom line. And God sent Abraham on this mission to another country with so many people. He had an army. You know, he, he had flocks and herds. It says he had gold. We'll read it. And, and you know, he was a rich man. And so he could handle that mission, no problem. He could take that whole family from here to Perth, which is the journey, and he had the provision to feed them every day. He had the provision to feed the animals, to look after them, all their animal husbandry needs, all the children, all the mothers, all the families, and he did it out of his back pocket. So, you know, we forget about these things. We forget. So tonight... We're talking about money, and you can't go on missions if you're flat broke. So if God wants the job done, then he provides. And I want to put an emphasis on that tonight, because I'm going to talk about work later on. Every vision that God gives has a provision. Every vision has a provision. It's there. Or vision and provision go together mission and money are equals they're equals you say i'm a missionary good on you and i'm believing god for wealth oh i don't know about that that's how our church has got our mind to think the devil got our mind to think like that so that no missions get done actually prosperity is part of the abrahamic covenant and as i said the abrahamic covenant has a top line and a bottom line it has a mission and a res it has a blessing the blessings of abraham and at the bottom line it has a responsibility so we're not just blessed to sit on our rusty dusty we're actually blessed to go out and complete the task and you know we can do more of the task if we're blessed than if we're not if we have some money in our back pocket we can do a lot of stuff and so that's what God wants us to believe him for. God never said we had to pay for it. Just listen to this. God said he would give us a vision, but he never said we had to pay for it. He said we had to believe God for it. We believe God. You know, money comes to a Christian in a different way than it does to an unbeliever. So prosperity is God's plan. I'm totally convinced of that, have been for years. And it's listed in the blessing, in the Bible, prosperity. We'll read some of it. And poverty is listed in the curse. 
And he blesses us, the Bible says, to establish his covenant. How much of his covenant can we establish? Well, sometimes it depends on how much money we can put into it. And so we want plenty. Now, don't think poor. You, you know, <laughs> this is a train. It's, roughly, it's got roughly 10 carriages. I counted them. And uh, I've told some of you this before, but just let me tell you again. It's worth it. If all the people in the world were put on that train and the front carriage had the richest people in the very front seat and then every carriage you go back people get poorer and poorer until the last person in the last seat on that train on the 10th carriage was just about to pass away because he can't afford food that's the range you've got Elon Musk at the front and you've got some poor character in India who's lying beside the Ganges about to pass away because he's got no food. All the people in the world are on that train. Whereabouts does the poorest person in Australia sit on that train? He sits in the front carriage at the 95th percentile, the poorest person in Australia. I don't think the poorest person in Australia is here tonight. If he is or she is, you're really covering it well. Uh, we sit in the top 5% of the whole world's population in wealth. And yet we can think poor. We go to a motel and we gather up all those little white bars of soap and take them home in a bucket. <laughs> we, we, uh, we've got a drawer full of empty margarine containers that we'll use one day. We've got half a drawer of those bread little twisties. You know, Sue's mum uh, is, um, I'm not speaking ill of her, but she's a dear lady. She was. She passed on just recently and went to heaven. And she will be amazed at heaven. There's no margarine containers. I don't know what she's going to do. But um, she had loads of that sort of thing. Because her mum and dad were brought up in the uh, Depression. And so their, their minds, the kids' minds, got, got trained to think like that. And that's poverty thinking. And if you think like that, you'll never ever break through to be rich. Never. You've got to stop thinking that way. You've got to, you've got to start thinking faith because it comes from God and our needs are met. And he is Jehovah Jireh. He's the one that meets our needs. So we have to change our thinking. And you know, we talk about the developing world. And Sue and I have spent a lot of time in the developing world and seen very poor people. Uh, and yet, they aren't poor because they have no resources in many cases. I will, I've told some of you this as well, but in the south of Malawi during the Mozambique War, a lot of people fled from Mozambique into this very... Uh, distant, um, unoccupied part of Malawi. But the Shiri River ran right through that part. The Shiri River is one of the most beautiful rivers you'll ever see. Crystal clear water. Uh, I don't know, might be 400 meters across and very deep. A beautiful big river. And just flows all the time. David Livingston went up that river on his journeys. And, you know, the soil, I saw the soil. I, I'd had a bit to do with farming and when I went down there you know I heard that all these people were dying and they were eating naika they called it a weed out of the river but they couldn't eat enough of it and many of them died many of them were dying and I said to one of them well what you've got this beautiful river you've got beautiful soil plant something and you know what the answer was this is their head getting in the way of a not a miracle just a practical reality they said to me, if God wanted that water on this land, he'd put it there. And they died. They died. And so our thinking can stop us and get in the way of the Lord's provision. So tonight we're starting, staying right in the bullseye, missions. That's where we're talking. That's what we're talking about. Finishing God's work on earth. So the devil has so disempowered the church that his provision to get the job done has been laughed at and scorned by even preachers. They laugh at it. They laugh at God's provision. 
They, they criticize ministers who seem to be well off. I know some of them, and I know some of the ones they criticize, and I know that they give millions, sometimes a week, to, mission, to, to, to ministries and missions, and never talk about it. But you can't do that unless you're rich. You can't do it. You know, the devil laughs and scorns the church at the moment because they've got no money to do God's will. And I don't want this church to be there. We, we need to be prosperity thinkers. We need to believe God for money. Money's not evil. Money will do what the owner do, tells it to do. And if we're born again Christians, we can do a lot with money. Amen? Amen. Anyone with me on this? Amen. So, you know... I don't want anyone here thinking I'll have to work harder because I don't want you working for a living. The Bible doesn't teach that. You say, but it, if a man doesn't work, he shouldn't eat. Absolutely. But we don't work for a living. The Bible says we live by faith. That's how we live. We live by faith. And work is important. Proverbs the New Testament, all of the Bible really teaches that we should work, but not for a living. That's where we get it wrong. You know, the, the Bible says, Let him who stole steal no longer, but rather let him labor, working with his hands what is good, that he may have something to give. We work to give. We work to give. You know the idea of retirement is actually not in the Bible. It's not in the Bible. People die when you, stop, when you stop work. You watch them. They all retire and sit at the bus stop. Four, four guys, you know, having a chat in the morning. And you drive past and then there's three. And then there's two. And then there's none. They, work is what we're meant to do. We're meant to work. We're meant to have our mind engaged, our body engaged. We're meant to be doing something. But not, not to live, to give. I wonder if we can get that. That's the Bible answer to a lot of things. Longevity for one. So let's have a look at uh, Abraham for a start. God said to him, I'll make you a great nation. I'll bless you. And I'll make your name great. Now God's not against these things. Otherwise he wouldn't have done it. Uh, he said, you shall be a blessing. Well, you can't be a blessing if you're flat broke. I'll bless those who bless you, and I'll curse him who curses you, and in all, and in you, sorry, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Notice that there was a top line and a bottom line. You can't just be blessed and blessed and blessed. I'm, I've met rich people. I've worked with them. I've, I've worked with a man, I've told you about him, some of you, that earned 25 million in six months when I was with him. And he was the saddest man on earth. He didn't know what to do with his money. He tried a few things. He tried, on average, $9,000 a night at the, where you do all the, at the casino. $9,000 a night. We knew that because he did it on the company's card. He didn't, he didn't hide it. It was his company and it was his card so he can do what he likes. But it wasn't hidden. $9,000 a night. Some of you have never spent $9,000 on anything but a car in your life, probably. $9,000 a night in the casino. And he was sad. This man was so sad. He was so sad. He had a mansion on the Gold Coast. I think he still has. A pretty well-known home, actually. He bought a boat. I think it's a 42-footer launch that sits out the front of his house in the canal there but he's too frightened to use it. But he's got one. He, he had the top holding. A lot of it was sort of handmade and hotted up. Amazing car. He took me for a spin in it once and showed me what it could do. And for his birthday, his wife bought him another one, just the same. <laughs> so, you know, now he's got two. He had, he had a garage. I forget how many cars it would hold. Maybe 20 or something. I just forget now. But he came to me once and he said, Dave, I don't know what's wrong with me. He said, I go home and I tell my boys off so severely, he said, because they leave the hall lights on. Yeah, okay. You, you, he couldn't work that out himself. And yet he could spend 9,000 on a night. 
So here's, here's, here's Abraham, a, a God man, a son of God, a friend of God, and God's blessing him. Now when Abraham was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to him and said to him, I am God Almighty. He had to tell him that because there was a few things coming up that Abraham was finding hard to swallow. He said, walk before me and be blameless. Well, you're blameless. This is under the old covenant. Under the new covenant, you're blameless. I will establish my covenant between me and you. Who's going to establish it? God will. And he said, I'll multiply you exceedingly. And Abraham fell on his face and God talked with him saying, as for me, behold, my covenant is with you and you will be the father of a multitude of nations. No longer shall your name be called Abram, but your name shall be Abraham. For I've made you the father of a multitude of nations. I'll make you exceedingly fruitful. God's not against it. And I'll make nations of you and kings will come forth from you. I will establish my covenant between me and you and your descendants and your descendants after you throughout their generations for an everlasting covenant to be God to you and to your descendants after you. I will give to you and to your descendants after you the land of your sojourning. See how he's telling Abraham, it's not going to be you doing this. I'm going to do this. And we've been brought up, many of us perhaps from a Methodist background particularly, because John Wesley uh, really emphasized how we should labor and work and look after ourselves. And labor and work is good but not for a living, for a giving. We don't have to look after ourselves. God's got it. The land of your sojournings, all the land of Canaan for, an ever, Canaan for an everlasting possession, and I will be their God. It goes on. I'm just skipping from mountaintop to mountaintop here. Abraham will surely become a great and mighty nation, and in him all the nations of the earth will be blessed. It's not just stopping at Abraham. Wealth should never stop with us. We should be a conduit. We should be givers. We should be the means to an end for the mission of God. Genesis 26, 4 said, I'll multiply your descendants as the stars of heaven, and I will give your descendants all these lands, and by your descendants, all the nations of the earth shall be blessed. See how he keeps it in balance all the way. It's not just bless, bless, bless. It's bless and mission. Genesis 26 one now talks about Abraham's son. I love this. This is Isaac. There was a famine in the land beside the first famine that was in the days of Abraham. So when Abraham got down into the promised land, there was a famine and they went to Egypt. Well, actually... Isaac found the same thing later on, faced the same trial. Isaac went to Abimelech, king of the Philistines in Gera. Then the Lord appeared to him and said, Don't go down to Egypt. Live in the land of which I shall tell you. Dwell in this land, and I will be with you, and I will bless you. This is a famine. The land's not looking good. And for you and your descendants, I give these lands and I will perform the oath, the covenant, which I swore to Abraham, your father. So the pressure's not on Isaac. All he had to do was be in the right place. You've got to be in the right place sometimes. You've got to stay where God wants you, even if it doesn't look good for a while. And I will make your descendants multiply as the stars of heaven. Same promise he gave to his dad. And I'll give to your descendants all these lands and in your seed... All the nations of the earth shall be blessed. So he gives him that responsibility. And because Abraham obeyed my voice and kept my charge, my commandments, my statutes, and my loves, and my laws. Then we get to Genesis 26. This is one you should remember. Then Isaac sowed in that land. It was a drought. Didn't look good, but he sowed. Sowing will be is part of the secret to breaking through into God's promises financially. You have to sow. It didn't look good, didn't look right, didn't look like it would work. It looked like it was a waste of seed. But Isaac sowed in that land and reaped the same year a hundredfold. And the Lord 
blessed him. Now listen to this. The man began to prosper and continued prospering until he became very prosperous. That's the Lord's work in our lives. He just sowed. He didn't pull back. He didn't store up bars of soap from the hotels that he called into. He sowed. A sowing heart is what the Lord gives us grace for. You say, oh, I don't know, I find it hard to give. It's a grace. The Lord will give you the grace. He, he gave this man grace. It was, he looked out as a farmer and he said, this is not the place to sow seed. This is not the time to sow seed. It's a drought. It's not going to work. It's going to waste all the seed that I've got. But he, he did what the Lord said. And the Lord looked after him and he began to prosper. He wasn't over prosperous, but he began to prosper. And he continued prospering until he became very prosperous. Is God against prosperity? He's not. He's helping this man to prosper. He wants you to prosper. He wants you to be a giver. You say, well, I can't give anything at the moment. Well, try sowing some seed. That'll help. You'll be amazed. For he had possessions of flocks and possessions of herds and great number of servants. So the Philistines envied him. And you know, I believe, I really believe that Christians should be the envy of the world. Let them talk about us. Let them see how much we can give. Let them see us prospering others. So later on, down in Egypt, Joseph died. And all his brothers and all that generation. But the sons of Israel were fruitful and increased greatly even in this terrible land of Egypt where they were captives and, and became slaves and they multiplied and became exceedingly mighty so that the land was filled with them that sounds like good church growth Deuteronomy 1 the Lord your God has multiplied you and behold you are this day like the stars of heaven in number so that it happened God said to Abraham come out Do you know what he did he took him outside because he didn't just talk to him Abraham had to have a picture he had to have his imagination working. And, you know, when he went outside and he saw all those stars, it, it twigged. He had now something to think about. He had a picture in his mind of what God wanted. He wanted the Milky Way of family. So, I don't even know whether you can see it in that part of the world. Can you? Who, who knows? I should There's know a lot that. Of stars, <laughs> a lot of stars. There's a lot of stars. Yeah. And so here it says, The Lord your God has multiplied you, and behold, you are this day like the stars of heaven in number. So it happened from an old man and an old lady who neither had a chance of having a child. They had plenty of children after the God promised them, and they stepped out in faith, and now the promise is fulfilled. May the Lord, the God of your fathers, increase you a thousandfold, more than you are, and bless you just as he has promised you. God is not holding back. He's not. Those people in Malawi, God was not trying to starve them to death. He was trying to get them blessed. Amen. Deuteronomy 7. He will love you and bless you and multiply you. He will also bless the fruit of your womb and the fruit of your ground, your grain and your new wine and your oil, the increase of your Heard and the young of your flock in the land which he swore to your forefathers to give you. Now we come over to Acts chapter 3 and we start to see how the writers of the New Testament draw on this. It is you who are the sons of the prophets and of the covenant which God made with your fathers, saying to Abraham, And in your seed all the families of the earth shall be blessed. For you first... God raised up his servant and sent him to bless you by turning every one of you from your wicked ways. Galatians, Paul takes it up. Jesus freed us from the curse of the law so that the blessings of Abraham could come upon us. Read the blessings of Abraham. They're ours. It's not just a theology. It's reality. This is how we live. And so the blessings, here, here they are. You want to hear them? This is, this is the blessings. If you fully obey the Lord your God, Jesus did that for us. 
and carefully keep all his commandments that I'm giving you today, the Lord your God will set you high above all the nations of the world. You will experience all these blessings if you obey the Lord your God. Your towns and your fields will be blessed. Town and country. Your children and your crops will be blessed. The offspring of your herds and flocks will be blessed. Your fruit baskets and breadboards will be blessed. These are the businesses that they were in. What business are you in? Wherever you go and whatever you do, you will be blessed. The Lord will conquer your enemies when they attack you. They do attack, but the Lord will conquer them. They will attack you from one direction, but they'll scatter from you in seven. The Lord will guarantee a blessing on everything you do and will fill your storehouses. How many storehouses have you got? With grain. The Lord your God will bless you in the land he is giving you. If you obey the commands of the Lord your God and walk in his ways, the Lord will establish you as his holy people as he swore he would do. Then all the nations of the world will see that you are a people claimed by the Lord and they will stand in awe of you. It's never too late to be blessed like this. Never too late. Just let God do it. He'll do it. There's a grace in this. There's a grace. There's a covenant. There's a God on the other side of the covenant wanting to make it happen. Don't you try and sweat it out. The Lord will give you prosperity in the land he swore to your ancestors. We're in the promised land. Amen. So the Lord will give you prosperity. The Lord will give it. People that argue against it are trying to stop the Lord from giving you something. Don't, don't let them. Don't let them. The Lord will give you prosperity in the land he swore to your ancestors to give you, blessing you with many children, numerous livestock and abundant crops. The Lord will send rain at the proper time from his rich treasury in the heavens and will bless all the work you do. It doesn't say don't work. He'll bless the work you do. You will lend to many nations, but you'll never need to borrow from them. If you listen to these commands of the Lord your God that I'm giving you today, and if you carefully obey them, the Lord will make you the head and not the tail. You'll always be on top and never at the bottom. You must not turn away from any of the commands I'm giving you today, nor follow after other gods and worship them. No one here is interested in doing that. That's why you're here tonight. God's got you all lined up for a blessing. And so the Bible says in Proverbs 10.22, the blessing, this is what we've just read, the blessing of the Lord maketh rich and adds no sorrow with it. That's what it does. That's what it does. Why would we want to fight against that? Why would we? The, you know the devil's got the church almost paralyzed and broke. And some churches are closing. They're broke. Their mission's over. They have got a calling. The building was built the, their forefathers who laid the foundation stone and blessed that building had in mind children coming into that place, families coming into that place, and they're closing them. Sue told me about a church in Maruka, I think, that's been sold to the Islamic faith. That's not what the, uh, the, the people that built it had in mind. So the blessing of the Lord makes one rich. You can't stop that. You can't criticize God for that. He does that. He'll, he'll do it. He'll do it. You, you have faith in him. Let, stop thinking that you're the, your own supply. You, you'll never keep up with the demand. But God will do it. He'll fix it. He'll look after you. The blessing of the Lord makes one rich and adds no sorrow with it. That man I talked about was such a sad man, and yet he had more money than all of us put together, probably. In 3 John 1, 2, Beloved, I pray that you may prosper. This is John. I pray that you may prosper in all things and be in health. That's nice. To, just a tag on there, isn't it? Believe God for your health. I do. Just as your soul prospers. You know, if your soul's not prospering, that's where it's got to start. You've got to, got, you've got to start thinking like a rich man, like a rich woman. You know... When you take stuff, you say, well, I paid for the room, so I'm allowed to take the box of tissues and I'm allowed to take all the soap and, 
you know those little bottles of horrible stuff that they give you for shower and all that it's shocking stuff isn't it I don't, I don't know what's in it but it, it's not good it, it's, it's like eight hydrochloric acid or something don't try drinking it no here lie the bones of Henry Jones now he is no more for what he thought was H2O was H2SO4 it's a bit like that stuff so <coughs> you know have a prosperous soul what about thinking of the people that own the motel don't even use their stuff let them save them having to buy a whole lot for next time use your own soap it's it's easy you can't hold those little things anyway <coughs> so and you know I hope none of you have got a drawer full of them <coughs> Beloved, I pray that you may prosper. I pray tonight that we all might prosper. I pray that we all might prosper. We've got, we've got a mission, haven't we? We know what to do with it. So don't think poor. Stop thinking poor. You might have to stop sucking on the toothpaste tube to try to get the last molecule out. Put it in the bin and get a new one. That's prosperous thinking. But we get caught because that's our nature. That's what we've been taught. But I pray that you may prosper in all things and be in health just as your soul prospers. So start with your soul. Start thinking like the Lord loves you and he looks after you and he cares for you. In Hebrews chapter 6 it says, For when God made promise to Abraham, because he could swear by no greater, he swore by himself, saying, Surely, surely, blessing I will bless you. And multiplying, I will multiply you. And so after he had patiently endured, sometimes there is that time when things don't look so rosy. Things look a bit tight, a bit tough. But after he had endured, and patiently endured, he obtained the promise. We live by the promises of God. Put your faith in there. He will not let you down. For man, men verily swear by the greater, and an oath for confirmation is to them an end of all strife. Listen to this. Wherein God, willing more abundantly to show unto the heirs of the promise the immutability of his counsel, confirmed it by an oath. That wasn't for Abraham. That was for his heirs. We are his heirs. God is more willing, he's willing more abundantly to show us than he was Abraham. You ready for that? He, he loves you so much. He cares for you. You need an abundance. Sometimes we need it to bless our grandchildren, our children, the neighbour. We've heard some things lately. A man that we've been communicating with had him out for lunch the other day. And, uh, you know, his marriage has fallen apart. Now he can't pay for his house and he's trying to make a living he's he's trying to make a living and he's not doing too well you know but we were able to bless him and uh i said to him he, i think he asked me what i did you know and i said well i do this that and i write a book or two you know he said what do you write oh i said actually it's more of a theological book because he's he didn't go to church yet he said oh i'd, I'd read it oh, so i gave him one i gave him one i'd said and i've asked the lord to really open his heart with it yeah. amen we we because we, we wouldn't it be good if we could give everybody just something you know there's so many needs right right next door let alone going overseas anyway by two immutable things in which it was impossible for god to lie we might have a strong consolation who have fled for refuge to lay hold upon the hope set before us that's where you run lay hold of god Run there. He's a refuge when the storm's on. Do you ever have a storm? Or am I the only one? Which hope we have as an anchor of the soul. It'll hold you steady. Both sure and steadfast. And which enters into that within the veil. Where the forerunner is for us entered. Even Jesus made a high priest forever. After the order of Melchizedek. A nice little link there to some of our mission teaching. Those two planes, that's uh, B uh, Billy Graham's sons on the left, uh, DC-8, but nicely done up, and they, they use it, you know, a lot. Actually, Daryl Murtha's son is a ranger in the American Army, 
and he's watched those uh, Billy Graham planes coming in and bringing aid into disaster areas. The one on the right is Lester Sumrall's C-130 and that travels all around the world. It's been into all sorts of places taking aid. That is not cheap to fly. You need money to do that. But if you want to be the first person on site after an earthquake or a tsunami, you've got to have the gear. You've got to be able to bless people. And it costs money. They, they do that. Isn't that great? It's wonderful. It's wonderful. They've got no poverty thinking. Lester Sumrall, you know, was a, just a poor boy, really, when he started. And now he's got that C-130. Romans 4 says this, Now the Lord had said to Abram, Get out of your country from your kindred, here's the New Testament picking up on it, and from your father's house to a land that I'll show you. I'll make you a great nation, I'll bless you, and make your name great, and you'll be a blessing. You'll be a blessing. That's the bottom line. That's what it's all for. You will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and I'll curse him who curses you, and in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So we get back into Genesis. Uh, after these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision, saying, Do not be afraid, Abram. I am your shield and your exceedingly great reward. That's the blessings, in a nutshell, of Abraham's covenant, protection and wealth. Then Abraham gets old. So in Genesis 24, we read, he got old, well advanced in age. And the Lord had blessed Abraham in all things. The Lord has blessed my master greatly, and he's become great. And he's given him flocks and herds, silver and gold, male and female servants and camels and donkeys. You know, this whole thread goes down through the Bible. But in the case of King David... And behold, David said, in my trouble, I prepared, in my trouble, he's prepared for the house of the Lord. That's a, that's a little secret right there. When things are not so good, don't give up on preparing for the house of the Lord. And he gave a hundred thousand talents of gold and a million talents of silver and of bronze and iron without weight. That's First Chronicles 22 now. Here's a, f a few sums. One talent of gold weighs about 1,094 troy ounces. That's what they measure gold in. And a troy ounce is the standard used today for trading in gold and silver. Based on that measurement, the total amount the king donated for the temple was 109 million, plus or minus, troy ounces. 109 million. So present day value at uh, today's rate, which is $2,011 for gold, that's pretty good, isn't it? Uh, is $220 billion US dollars or $331 billion Australian. David was not poor, and yet he started off as a shepherd boy. Just by way of comparison, the richest man on earth today is Bernard, Bernard Arnault. He's $236 billion. David was up in that league, left him behind a little. He, he's the CEO chair of LVMH, which includes Louis Vuitton, Sephora, Tiffany & Co, Agachi, Agla Ventures, which is a property venture company, Netflix, he's got an interest in TikTok, ByteDance, and Christian Dior. You know, he's not, how, how would you get that rich on stuff that smells and stinks <laughs> but he did he did he didn't he didn't miss the opportunity and I don't think he's a Christian he doesn't look that happy to me I looked at that photo and I looked into his eyes and I think he needs the Lord but it'd be good if he found the Lord wouldn't it wouldn't that be great so King David, a man after God's own heart, was fabulously rich during his life. He generously bequeathed as his last great offering to God the finest materials for constructing and furnishing the temple in Jerusalem. After this, those figures that I told you about David, he actually gave a number of billion more. So the Bible says, Remember the Lord your God, for it is He who gives you the ability to produce wealth. 
He's not against it. That's, that's robbed the church worldwide. But remember the Lord. That's a covenant word. Covenant word. Remember. Remember. Engage the covenant. The Lord your God. For it is he who gives you the ability to produce wealth. It doesn't matter whether you've got any or not at the moment. But this is his plan. And it's never too late. And so confirms his covenant. You say, oh, I don't know how this could work for me. I've only, I only get you know, a certain amount a week. I don't see how... No, no, that's you trying to work it out in me. This is him giving you the ability to produce wealth. And he confirms his covenant. Let me give you an example. I know a man. Three of his, two of his friends rang him. I think they rang him and said, listen, there's a bit of land and we can get it for $3,000. It wasn't a huge area, but it was quite big. A few acres, I think. 3,000, they said, we're gonna go 1,000 each, you in? And they put their 1,000 in, and he thought about it and said, nah, I'm not gonna put 1,000 into that bit of dirt. And so they went 1,500 each and bought it. And just, I think, less than a month or just a short time later, the Air Force came to them and said, we need that for an airport, we'll offer you 3 million. And he doesn't drive past there now anymore. <laughs> He's too, he hurts too much. You know, for a thousand dollars, he could have been a millionaire. God knows that. He should have listened to the Lord. That's actually his testimony. And he has done since, but my word, he missed a good one. So remember the Lord your God, for it is he who gives you the ability to produce wealth. If it was wrong, he'd never do it. He'd never give you the ability and so can, he confirms his covenant. He's got a covenant with us. He wants to confirm it. He wants us to see it. And so this is how we do it. Which he swore to your ancestors as it is this day. New, New Living says, Remember the Lord your God. He is the one who gives you power to be successful in order to fulfill the covenant he confirmed to your ancestors with an oath. And New King James and you shall remember the Lord your God, for it is he who gives you power to get wealth, that he may establish his covenant, which he swore to your fathers, as it is this day. So Isaiah chapter 1, a great scripture. Many of you will have read and loved this. If you're willing and obedient, you shall eat the good of the land. Don't just be obedient. Get your will in line. You can do that in 10 seconds flat. If you're willing and obedient, you shall eat the good of the land. There's a lot of souls that we're going to affect through our church. You say, I can't work hard enough to earn the money I need. No, no, you work for a giving and let the Lord do it. We're going to affect people, this church. It's going to go out like Daryl said right when we started. It'll ripple out, it'll affect people miles away and it'll affect people close. You believe that? And we, we'll need, we need to do some stuff, you know. We need to. We need to do stuff around here. But, you know, if the Lord calls us to do stuff for other people first, well, let's just believe Him and trust Him and step into it. Amen? Amen. Amen. Well, God bless you all.